I am uh, really thrilled that CED um, is uh, hosting such an important conference uh, and has put um, what I think is a tremendously important topic, uh, judicial selection reform, uh, on the agenda um, for your discussion. Um, this is an issue that I think we should all, um, must all pay much more attention to. Um, it plays a significant role in Americans' lives. Uh, and I think there's much that we can do to make uh, the system better. Um, you know, as we've heard, uh, and I think this is laid out extremely well in the CED report, and I don't know if everybody has had a chance to read it, but I commend it to you. Um, but we have to recognize that uh, in, in much of the United States, we have judges who are politicians uh, that contrary to what we expect the role of a judge to be, um, they are actually under pressure, under pressure from, from politicians and from interest groups, uh, under pressure from political contributors uh, and from attack ads. Um, and this really doesn't comport, I think, with what we think the role of a judge should be, which is as a neutral arbiter uh, of important disputes. Uh, we want fairness, we want justice, we don't want politics. But unfortunately, the independence of our judiciary is very much at risk. Um, we have 38 states in, the, in this country that at some level, judges are elected. Uh, and this leads to all sorts of, of unfortunate consequences. Um, but let me just, just step back for a second to say that, you know, I think many of us in Washington um, spend a lot of time thinking and talking about the federal judiciary and what the Supreme Court is doing. Um, but the state court system um, absolutely dwarfs the federal system in terms of the number of cases decided and the, and the real poignancy uh, and uh, incredible importance of the cases that are decided, certainly from a personal side, people's divorce cases and custody cases, but some incredibly important business issues, commercial disputes, contract uh, issues are decided in our state courts. Um, and so it is an arena that we really must pay much more attention to. So I want to put, a, before we go to questions, and I will introduce the panel, I just wanted to mention a report that my organization has put out, um, which kind of brings uh, this issue, I think, uh, it sort of underscores what I think most of us would find troubling about the role of money uh, in our state judiciary. Um, and we looked at, um, uh, in, in building on some uh, research that the Brennan Center had, has done on uh, uh, the volume of independent expenditures uh, in, uh, in state judicial elections, and particularly in attack ads that are being run, um, which after Citizens United um, has just reached a volume that is just unbelievable. Um, but we now have a, a situation where um, interest groups that may not have any real interest in criminal justice matters, they're using criminal justice as a proxy. Um, and, and I think we'll, we'll talk uh, to Hugh Caperton a little bit more about this, but use criminal justice and say a rape case or a child molestation case or a murder case um, as the theme of an attack ad that goes after a judge uh, uh, either because they don't want that judge on the bench or because they want to influence that judge. Um, and we have actually seen through this research project that over time with the volume of ads uh, uh, and the change in the law post Citizens United that there actually has been a swing, a decided swing in how our state court judges are ruling on criminal justice matters. And so I put this to you because I think as anybody who cares about due process and fairness in our system to see that we can actually track with data um, a change in how judges are voting uh, uh, on matters of this, uh, of this kind of significance, I think is extraordinarily problematic. Um, so I'm gonna briefly introduce uh, our panel and um, as uh, with all the biographies of all of your speakers, um, they are um, at greater length in the handouts that you have. Um, but I'm incredibly honored to be here with uh, Randall Shepard, who is the former Chief Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court, Wallace Jefferson, who is the former Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court, with Hugh Caperton, who is the former President of Harmon Mining Company and the plaintiff in Caperton versus Massey, uh, and Tony Corrado, who is a Senior Fellow in Governance Studies 
uh, at, at Brookings uh, and professor of government at Colby College and is an um, extraordinarily uh, renowned expert on these matters. So, um, you know, just quickly, again, you know, we're, the, the, the change since Citizens United has been very profound. We've had an incredible increase over the past couple of decades uh, of the amount of money being spent um, in, in elections and direct contributions to candidates and now post Citizens United um, in independent expenditures. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think some people might find this to be not an issue and they would say, you know, this is the way the world is. What difference does it really make? Um, and as I've said, I think our study on the criminal justice side shows that the money does actually start to have an impact. But I'd, you know, I'd like to turn to those who've really been in the middle of um, this world um, and to ask, you know, on what level uh, do you think the, the increase in money um, is a problem, money itself is a problem, um, and can you tell us a little bit about um, your personal experiences? And I'd, I'd like to just go in order, um, uh, if that's okay, and, and we'll start with uh, uh, Randy. I think the money trend has been going for uh, the better part of 10 years. It began in Ohio and Michigan um, and it has been exacerbated by a series of decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court. There is a third major case now pending. The second case, of course, was Hugh Caperton's case, uh, and the first one was a case from Minnesota. Uh, Indiana uses uh, merit selection, and uh, we have never had a big money judicial race. A lot of our trial judges are elected in partisan elections, uh, but if you're trying to buy an outcome, uh, hardly anybody wants to pay retail. You'd, you'd like to buy wholesale. <laughs> and um, it isn't worth buying a trial judge. It's just not worth it. Um, uh, it, happens, it happens at the appellate level, and it happens in courts of last resort. And that's why places like the Supreme Court of, of Ohio and Michigan and uh, during one period the Supreme Court of Texas uh, are places where uh, the interest groups decide to spend money. This happens rarely uh, because people sit down in Des Moines and say, let's have a judicial food fight and spend four or five million dollars on it. It just doesn't happen that way. It happens because people sit in this city and either the green billionaires or the chamber uh, or the personal injury bar all decide that we're going to contest with each other in some place uh, where we might change the vote uh, in Illinois or now in Wisconsin and they, they all pour money into it. And uh, uh, very commonly, the result is that they fight each other to a standstill. Uh, the retention votes, which some of which have become contested, mostly produce judges that are retained. The partisan elections frequently do not result in a turnover, though some of that has happened. The one thing it does do is leave the judiciary looking pretty bad uh, because of attack ads like the one you've mentioned. Um, makes the public wonder whether the judiciary really is uh, uh, really a reliable crowd or not. And I think that's the long-range threat to the country. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to amend um, what I said before, and maybe we'll go for, for the Wallace next. If that's okay, we'll stick with the judges, and then we'll have the plaintiff. <laughs> um, well, I'm from a jurisdiction, Texas, in which judges are elected uh, from top to bottom trial court to the Supreme Court of Texas in partisan political races. And um, so I served on court from 2001 through 2013 and uh, was in two, uh, I was a candidate in three elections and two of them were contested. Um, and so I uh, participated, I know what it's like and it's a horrible thing and, and it's something that I think most people don't, don't really think about. Um, when I ran for election, I would ask people uh, for their vote. They didn't even know they voted for judges. They had no idea. Uh, because in Texas, you can vote straight ticket, so you vote all Republican or all Democrat, and you just sweep people in. And that resulted in uh, a number of years, I mean, this has gone on for about 25 years now, where um, Harris County, that's Houston, um, all the Democrats swept out of office in 2010 because people were mad at Obama. But in 2008, all the Republicans were swept out, all the judges. And if you think about, you have a case of enormous commercial interest pending in a trial court worth a billion dollars, and all of a sudden, some new judge comes in who's never tried a case in his or her life. 
There are no qualifications uh, to speak of for judges. Uh, and yet these huge matters, life and death, business, family relationships, all of that uh, are, is being overseen by a judge who may or may not have the kind of experience that you would want in your general counsel. Um, that's a, a huge problem. And it is true that it's something like 98% of litigation takes place in state courts, not in federal courts. I was um, thinking about this, and I just wrote down a list from memory of the kinds of cases uh, that were before my court. And here's some of the companies that uh, were involved when I was on the court. Compact and Grant Thornton and AT&T and ExxonMobil and General Motors and American Airlines and Clear Channel Communications, Crown Cork and Seal. I mean, just I was just jotting these down, and these were uh, very impactful cases that um, made a huge difference in, you know, your, in, in your market position. Uh, and it's true in Texas and it's true across the states. I would have, I, I want to leave with one homework assignment for you, and I know we want to hear uh, talk about money in politics, but one thing I would encourage you to do when you get to your jurisdictions is uh, contact your general counsel or CEO, get a number, get 10 of them together in a room and ask two questions. Are your courts fair and impartial? And is your legislature supporting the courts uh, financially? Are they giving them the resources to do the job? Uh, the answer is going to be in, in states where judges are elected, are your courts fair and impartial? Probably not. Or maybe this time, maybe not next time, it depends. It's a lottery who gets in, uh, who's on the bench, even on the Supreme Court of Texas. I could have been defeated um, easily just by the virtue of a political sweep. That's not going to happen in Texas for a while. But maybe somebody with a, a, a better name than mine. My parents gave me a good name, Wallace Jefferson. That's good for... Uh, <laughs> Or maybe somebody who raised more money than I do. I mean, it's really a lottery. So the first thing, is it fair and impartial? You're lucky if it is. And the second thing, are the courts being funded properly? The answer is no. Uh, and so it's hard for uh, state courts to put the resources in to make sure that your cases and all cases are, are heard um, fairly and impartially. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Let's, now let's hear a little bit about what it feels like to be in one of those courts. <laughs> a, a lot of those courts. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you to Seed for uh, CD for having me up today. I, I appreciate it very much, um, uh, and and to uh, Mike Petro, my good friend, and uh, and all the work they do on judicial selection reform. It's it's uh, it's just an extremely important issue in our in our country today. Um, you probably look up here and you see these really distinguished legal scholars here, and you look at me and you say, "Well, what's a coal miner from West Virginia doing in the middle of these guys?" So I, I figured I might want to go through my bona fides so everybody will know why I'm here. And um, so um, I know they've, they've all participated in different courts, but throughout my 18-year uh, legal ordeal uh, that I've been through, um, I've been in every imaginable court in the country. I've been in federal bankruptcy court, federal district court. Uh, I've been in uh, circuit courts in West Virginia and Virginia. I've been in Supreme Courts in West Virginia and Virginia, and ultimately I've been in the U.S. Supreme Court. So the only court I haven't been in so far is Magistrate Court, but I have two teenagers at home, so I'll probably <laughs> might end up there. But anyway, but I, what I can share is a, a kind of unique perspective because uh, Virginia and West Virginia are complete polar opposites in that Virginia is a merit-based uh, selection um, state, and West Virginia is just like Texas. Everyone, everyone's elected uh, judges. Uh, just uh, Supreme Court justices, everybody is. So I've seen how both of them, bo both of them operate. Um, I'm going to try to roll about 18 years of history into about four or five minutes here. So just uh, bear with me. But so you'll understand uh, a little bit about my case. Um, I purchased Harmon Mining Company in 1992. Uh, it was a union company. Uh, undergoing a tremendous, is in the middle of a tremendous labor strike, uh, very contentious. And we were able to uh, solve those differences and put 150 miners back to work and, uh, and, and ultimately uh, get our, got our production up to about a million tons a year. We were a small independent coal operation, which there are none of those left anymore. But uh, in 1998, my company was illegally forced out of business by a bigger uh, predatory company, which was Massey Energy, under the direction of their CEO at the time, Don Blankenship, who is currently awaiting trial on federal criminal charges for his role in the 
upper big branch mining disaster that killed 29 people. Um, they did this in an attempt to uh, subvert a, uh, a very uh, lucrative coal contract that Harmon had and tried to move that to one of their own companies by buying, a, buying the company that I sold to. They, uh, so they, they, uh, they did that. And in, or, uh, in order to achieve uh, putting me out of, out of business, they, uh, they concocted a, a well-documented scheme uh, that would uh, drive me out of business and, and make sure that I never, never was, uh, would come back. I, in the process of destroying my company uh, and my livelihood, they cost those 150 miners their jobs and their benefits, and they drained $25 million a year out of the uh, Southwest Virginia economy. By August of 2002, Harmon had been successful in two lawsuits against Massey. One, a breach of contract, uh, the breach of contract suit for about $6 million and the other, a tortious interference uh, and fraud suit, which a West Virginia dis uh, jury decided in our favor and awarded us $50 million in damages. The latter at the time was pending on appeal in West Virginia. Uh, that's when Mr. Blankenship decided that he'd kind of take a different path to evade justice. And uh, to do so, he decided that he would uh, get involved in the Supreme Court of West Virginia, and he did that by injecting millions of dollars of his own money into the campaign, into a, a campaign in, in West Virginia for a Supreme Court justice. <clears throat> of course, they had, to, they had to do a little bit of legal wrangling at the same time because we were, we had this, uh, we were waiting on final uh, order of the judge in our case, so they filed motion after motion after motion to push that out to almost three years down the road past the general election in 2004. So um, in that time frame, uh, Don Blankenship donated over three and a half million, or contributed three and a half million dollars to the campaign of Brent Benjamin for Supreme Court Justice. And he did that through both direct and indirect campaign contributions and contributions to a 527 uh, political action committee that was named, and for the sake of our kids. And um, it never did anything for the sake of any kids in West Virginia, but. But the main purpose of this organization was to run attack ads against Brent Benjamin's opponent that accused him of being soft on crime and going easy on child, a child rapist. Um, so at that time, that was the most money ever spent on a, West, a campaign in West Virginia, period. And it was very successful. They got their man elected. So uh, in 2007, finally, after three more years of waiting, uh, Caperton v. Massey was argued in front of the court, and it was overturned by a three to two decision with Justice Brent Benjamin casting the deciding vote, despite the fact that we had asked him, uh, filed a motion and asked him to recuse himself from the case. The lower court's decision was not dismissed on the merits of the case. It was dismissed on a, technical, a technicality, forum selection. We had picked the wrong forum for the case. This had been argued ad nauseum in federal courts and bankruptcy courts and everywhere else 10 years prior to this, prior, prior nine years prior to this ruling. <clears throat> but that, they couldn't do, they couldn't dismiss it on forum selection until they rewrote eight laws, new laws for forum selection in West Virginia and applied them retroactively to our case. And that, that's how they were able to get rid of it. Now, um, Robin Davis, Justice Robin Davis, who was the Chief Justice at the time, um, she, in her, in her majority opinion, this is a quote that she made. We wish to make it perfectly clear that the facts of the case demonstrate that Massey's conduct warranted the type of judgment rendered in this case. However, no matter how sympathetic the facts are or how egregious the conduct, we simply cannot compromise the law in order to reach a result that clearly appears to be justified. So the jury got it right. Um, shortly after that decision was rendered, while we're, wait, we're in the process of appealing their, their decision, another justice, Justice Spike Maynard, um, who also voted with the majority, uh, he and Don Blankenship were caught vacationing in the south of France together. <laughs> and those pictures ended up on the front page of the New York Times. Um, as well as pending, right? Yes, while it was pending, yes. So he was forced to recuse himself, 
And another of the justices, Justice Larry Starcher, had made some unflattering comments about Mr. Blankenship to the press, so he decided to recuse himself. By this time, we have a new Chief Justice, and that's Brent Benjamin. And Brent Benjamin selected the two uh, replacement judges uh, to sit on this case against me. And this is after we had again asked for his recu recusal on the matter. So they upheld their earlier decision, three to two, and it was this decision that pushed us to go to the U.S. Supreme Court, take our case to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, on, on the matter of recusal. So I do come at this with a different uh, perspective, and I come at this perspective as a businessman. So in 2002, when this all started for me, I was just like probably everyone here, uh, I really didn't care about how they elected judges or justices. I, every once in a while I'd have a friend that was running for a judge or something and I would give him $50 and that would be it. And I didn't understand the consequences of big money uh, campaign uh, donations into, into judicial campaigns. So what we're basically doing is we're turning judges and justices into politicians. And it's making it, uh, it's, it's really ruining our justice system because it, it just leads to the clear-cut uh, ending to this thing, is that justice is for sale to the highest bidder. <clears throat> right, well, and I, I don't want to um, leave out the important uh, end to your story, which is that you won <laughs> in the Supreme Court. Um, well, I'm sorry, I didn't, know, I didn't want to go too, okay. I didn't want to go too long, well, but yes. Just, just to make sure everybody knows that this was a very, very important case, um, Supreme Court hasn't been very friendly of late um, to issues raising uh, campaign finance questions, but when it came to this particular set of fact patterns involving um, Supreme Court justices, uh, all of a sudden there was a due process violation, um, understandably, and uh, uh, they uh, they ruled in uh, in Hughes' favor. So I think um, that's that's one um, for the, for on the on the side of the good. <laughs> and and uh, and just to and, and then I'll follow that up. So we went back to West Virginia. Justice Benjamin recused himself, and the court rallied around Justice their fallen hero, Justice Benjamin, and we again lost. So so uh, at that time, I, I think it's that's the definition of insanity. We tried three times with the same result. So we uh, we moved on to the Virginia where uh, we are now in front of a, uh, we're, we're starting over at, at, at uh, square one a little bit. But it's the, the uh, atmosphere in a, in a Virginia court versus a West Virginia court is a completely, uh, it's a completely different feeling. Uh, you don't, you're not looking at judges thinking, who's bought them? Who owns that judge? You know, is he gonna, is he gonna rule in our favor or not because of a contribution that was made by a bigger coal company? So that's, the, that's where this, this issue becomes so important and became so important to me to where I've become an advocate for uh, judicial selection reform. Um, I think the odds, and, and uh, Justice Jefferson will probably agree with me, the odds of West Virginia ever becoming a, a, a change into a merit selection um, for, for judges is probably not gonna happen in my lifetime. But that's why recusal reform also is, is critical. But, um, and that's why I think you see West Virginia at the bottom of the uh, economic development list is because of the, uh, ju the atmosphere created in our judicial system. Thank you. And, I, you know, so that, that's an you know, incredible set of facts. Um, and I'd like, to, uh, Tony, if, if you would, uh, as you are um, the resident expert on this panel, um, on the biggest of the big picture, um, sort of, how does this fit in, and is this is this a typical story? Um, and what are um, sort of the the general facts about uh, state court elections that uh, this audience should uh, pay attention to? Well, since you've uh, heard from the justices and you've heard from the plaintiff, I guess that leaves me as the defendant. <laughs> uh, and I think that uh, probably I'll have to choose to defend reform rather than the current system in this panel because of the fact that I think that current system is highly problematic. Uh, to put this all in broader perspective, uh, generally we've seen a remarkable change in the character of judicial elections over the course of the last 20 years. Uh, as Mike Petro noted, CED came to this issue initially back in around 2002 when CED 
saw that the change in elections was starting to t take place. There was an apparent change in the character of judicial elections. For the most part, judicial elections had to that time been relatively low-key, civil affairs, very little campaigning. Uh, it wasn't atypical to find that uh, judges really raised no money and didn't do much campaigning other than to perhaps speak to the local Kiwanis at some point in the campaign, uh, even where there were elections. And what began to happen in the 1990s was that these elections became more competitive, they became more politicized, they became more costly. As you started to see this move towards pursuing, as I think Carolyn put it nicely, uh, legal issues by determining who the judge would be to determine that issue. And at that point, it was largely in a relatively small group of states. Uh, as was noted, there are about 38 states where judges appear on the ballot in some form. They are either, in the first instance, elected to office and then re-elected, or they are initially appointed to office, as in these merit-based systems, and then they stand before the electorate in a retention election to determine whether they will stay on the bench, where at the end of a set term, the voters are then asked to vote yes or no on keeping that judge. And these elections, for the most part, in the 90s, where you had partisan races, uh, as I believe uh, Justice Shepard noted, in places like Ohio and Michigan, you had hotly contested races, to the point where they were starting to become million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar races, as the Democrats and Republicans fought to get their judge onto the state's high court because it became a battle over whether the Republicans or the Democrats would control the majority of the court. And at that time, CED began looking at this issue uh, less through the partisan politics of this, but more uh, through their concern about the rule of law. And at that time, we were looking at you know, kind of a basic principle of the security of rule of law in the United States which is clearly not only a cornerstone of our judicial system, but is essential to business, and consequently began to look at how are judges placed on the bench, because we felt that how a judge is first placed on the bench was central to the impartial administration of law, and ultimately to the quality of justice. And as we began to look at this, what we noticed was that it was often the case that judges weren't really being viewed as neutral arbiters of the law, who would essentially look at the facts of the case and the law and apply it in a fair and impartial manner. But more and more in key situations, judges were being elected largely with the support of the interests that were going to appear before them in court. As we started to look at these races, what we found was that it was often the case that these races involved uh, attorneys uh, from the plaintiff's bar versus attorneys from the defense bar, or labor unions versus business interests, who picked one side or the other and tried to elect their candidate or defeat a candidate for office, that was starting to really turn these elections into races that looked a lot more like legislative races than they looked like judicial selection. And as we began to look at this, what we found was that uh, after our initial report, uh, that this situation was getting worse. As the role of state courts have increased, as Carolyn noted, many more issues are starting to come before the state courts. And as those issues began to be taken to court, and as trial attorneys showed a willingness to take more and more issues to court, uh, whether it would be a legal decision or a business uh, decision like Mr. Capertrain was involved in, or more currently uh, debates over implementation of the Affordable Care Act on a state-by-state -state basis, what you found was that there was a greater and greater incentive to participate in these elections to determine who would be the judge. So that as the role of state courts grew, the incentives to participate in these elections grew, and what we found was that more and more of these races began to become highly competitive contests. Uh, to put this in broader perspective, what did that mean? Well, first, more states are starting to see these highly expensive, money-driven, television advertising-based, interest group politicking judicial races, particularly where a judgeship is seen as going to sway the view of the court particularly where there's a race where the judges who are up could shift the perceived balance on a court. 
Uh, consequently, in the period from 2000 to 2009, spending on judicial elections more than doubled to the point where more than a couple of hundred million dollars was now being spent on these races that in the previous decade had only seen about $80 million in total spending. Now in the most recent elections, we've seen a new change where in the post-Citizens United era, there is much greater activity on the part of interest groups, particularly national interest groups, getting involved in these races, where they see these state courts essential as uh, more or less uh, the body that will ultimately legitimate their policy preference, and therefore they have gotten the incentive to start to embark on more or less nationwide e efforts where these groups come in uh, to try to either support or defeat judges who share or don't share their view on a particular issue. Uh, so that just to give you two examples, in Iowa in 2010, three of the justices on the Iowa Supreme Court were up for retention. Uh, traditionally, Iowa retention elections have not been uh, affairs that featured uh, much campaigning. Uh, judges. Uh, don't raise money uh, when they seek retention. Uh, for the most part, uh, these retention elections uh, produce the result that Justice Shepard noted, where the judges would just be retained and a majority would vote yes, and they would be returned to the court. But the Iowa Supreme Court had made a decision, uh, one ruling in 2010, uh, that a couple of national interest groups opposed and therefore, these groups came in, uh, spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars on television advertising against the three judges who were up for retention and defeated all three, uh, making it the first election in Iowa where a, a retention election had produced uh, a turnover in the judges. Uh, in Florida, in 2012, three members of the Supreme Court were up for retention. Uh, these three judges had previously been up for retention in 2006. They had been up for retention in 2000. Uh, there were really no issues raised in the campaign. Uh, it wasn't really competitive. Uh, the justices were retained on the bench. Uh, and during that whole period, uh, judges up for retention in Florida from 2000 to 2010 had raised a total of $7,500. And all of that money had been raised in 2000. In 2012, these three judges became uh, the target of concern because they felt maybe we're going to become the next Iowa. And what happened was liberal groups and a number of law firms in uh, Florida uh, put together a large amount of money to make sure that these three judges were kept on the bench because they were seen to be the liberal wing of the Florida Supreme Court. And the justices ended up raising $1.5 million. Uh, as opposed to zero six years earlier. And liberal advocacy groups and the trial attorneys formed a coalition, much like you saw with and for the sake of kids, but they called their coalition Defend Justice from Politics and engaged in political activity to the tune of $3 million, including a $1.5 million advertising campaign to make sure these judges were kept on the bench. Let me just give you a flavor, though, of one thing that the judges can do. If you're an in incumbent judge, and this happens in Texas, and I've, uh, I've written about this before, there are no restrictions on how you can raise money. There's a case pending in the U.S. Supreme Court about whether a judge can personally solicit funds. So let's just say I'm on the ballot. Um, and I want the maximum contribution from your corporation. I can call your general counsel and say, can you give me the maximum amount? What are you going to say? Uh, you've got cases pending in the court. Uh, and so people write checks. Or, or I can call lawyers, and, and I've written about this too, where you, you, you call the lawyer and you say, would you support my campaign? Lawyer says, I'm not really involved in politics. I can't. And I say, well, you have cases that are in my court, correct? Um, do you think I've done a good job? He's the head of a major law firm. Um, would you reconsider? The, the person writes a check, you know? I mean, this, and, and the public, the, the problem with this system, uh, another problem with this system is the public rightfully believes that this concept of fair and impartial justice is completely torn apart by this sort of campaigning and this sort of practice. And when, once the, the democracy, the, the populace, loses faith in its courts, I think we're on a very dangerous downward trend nationally. 
Um, that's a, a huge problem. The second biggest problem to me, and I'm not sure which order this is, is in, is when you have elections the way we have them in Texas and in many other states, the qualifications to be on the ballot, uh, to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas, you have to be 35 years old, have practiced 10 years, and be licensed. Uh, I mean, that's it. Uh, th there's no, there's no uh, looking into your qualifications, experience, ethics, well, you know, how hard you work, none of that. And so people at the top can be elected having no business being on the court. And maybe, and very often, uh, the people are running because they want an increase in their annual salary. Uh, when I came to the bench, uh, this will shock you. Uh, you the, the Supreme Court judges were paid 113000 uh, this is in 2001. It went up to 152 by the time I left the court. Now, uh, there are people competing to, to get these salaries because their practice is in shambles. This is not how you would hire your general counsel or your surgeon if you wanted, you know, you had a uh, brain surgery. You know, this is, and so it's insane. And, and you know, what we found is that these views are shared by the business community. You know, four out of five business leaders now that we have surveyed at CED uh, say that they're very worried about the effect of campaign contributions on the judgments in the courts. Uh, it's near universal that the business community feels that the system is leading to the judges being accountable to politicians. And the other thing that we have found is, is for the most part, that uh, the litigation environment uh, as shown by the Chamber of Commerce's annual surveys. The litigation environment in a state is becoming an increasingly important uh, factor in business decision making. 70% uh, of business leaders now say that the litigation environment in a state will impact major business decisions. And those surveys show year after year that the states that have partisan elections are at the bottom of that list. And in terms of the support for the courts, this is one of the other problems CED has found. Uh, actually, in, in Texas, they're fairly well paid. Uh, the problem we have found is that in most states, no one wants to run for the Supreme Court or the highest courts because of the fact that the pay cut would be so substantial. Uh, to just give you an example, you know, the average median salary now for trial appellate judges uh, in the states is below that for the median salary of first-year associates at major law firms. Uh, in fact, I looked at one analysis of Boston where the appellate court judges in Boston now make less than the first-year associates at 33 of the law firms in Boston. And, and there were 4,000 municipal employees in Massachusetts who make more than the uh, appellate court judges in Massachusetts now. Uh, one of the things we found is that judicial compensation as part of this support for the courts that you mentioned is one of the real issues that needs to be addressed and isn't being addressed so that it becomes difficult to recruit the best talent into these positions so that it's often the case that the poorest paid person in the room is the person who's going to make the decision in these big legal cases. Um, so I'm going to just jump in here because I wanted to um, bring us back a little bit to the Williams U. Lee case um, that Justice Jefferson um, has brought up and uh, Justice Shepard had alluded to earlier. And I, I, if we could talk a little bit more about that because I think it's probably not that well known um, uh, to the audience, um, but it's a very significant case and it goes directly to the issue of judges engaged in direct solicitations, which a number of states have found unseemly um, and have tried to regulate, which doesn't mean that judges can't get campaign contributions, but at least they are not involved in the direct um, request. So can you talk a little bit about why this case matters? Well, I was there to hear the argument. Um, it is part of a series of um, challenges to uh, the rules of conduct that have applied to judges since the 1920s. Um, the, the piece of society that's been working to dismantle these, by the way, is the civil liberties uh, organizations of the country, not, not either the plaintiff's bar or the defense bar. Um, and one of the questions is, as uh, Chief Justice Jefferson has said, uh, is it all right to tell a candidate for judge or a sitting judge that, that he or she can't look a lawyer in the eye and say, uh, will you give to my campaign? I, there, there is, by the way, an old story that is attributed to Texas where it's the uh, judge is holding a pretrial conference and um, the um, 
one side comes in and says, Judge, uh, the lawyer comes in and says, I, we know you're up for re-election and a lot of work's been put into this case and we, my client would really like to see you continue to serve and uh, he's willing to contribute $10,000 to make that happen. The judge is a little surprised and the other lawyer's pretty surprised. Uh, not sure what to say, but he says, Judge, I, I, think my, uh, I think my client has the same attitude about you, and, and, and I, on his behalf, I commit to his contribution of $10,000. The, 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 the judge thinks that over for a while, decides to take both contributions and decided on the merits. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the, at stake is, uh, as was said in the argument, is it all right for the judge to be able to look the, the litigant in the eye and say, I need your contribution to stay on the bench before election or after, because as your brief pointed out, in the, uh, there are people who will make these demands after they get reelected, uh, including one you cited in which they asked for interest, right? Late, late payment usually requires interest. It was a, a letter from a judge who won that said, uh, now it's time to get on the late train. You, you, appointed, you, you uh, supported my opponent, and now uh, I need your money uh, for my office holder account. So, the, uh, so this the, happens. Yeah, the trend of this litigation has been the following. Um, if you're going to have an election, it ought to be a real election. And so a series of cases, mo most of these challenges have been turned down in state courts. They mostly, and they've been turned down in some federal courts. The Seventh Circuit, under the pen of Frank Easterbrook, uh, a uh, man of impeccable credentials on the conservative side said that the, that the restraints on judicial campaign behavior were appropriate in protection, not of the interest of the judge or the interest, in protection of the notion of due process. I mean, if you have an election in which somebody campaigns for office and says, um, I think that the practice on child custody has been awful and if you elect me, at least half of all contested child custody cases, the father's going to win. Well, that's pretty good if you find yourself in court and, and, and you're the grandfather hoping you're in this divorce that your son's going to get it. But it doesn't look so good if you're worried about whether your daughter ought to have custody or not. And, and, and there are a variety of other things. There are campaigns, recorded campaigns, in which the candidate says, if you elect me, every single person who's convicted of drunk driving in my court will go to prison, period. Um, uh, but you could, that's a real life example um, in which no, no distinction is made between the person who's, a, I, I once sentenced to the maximum term, a seven time drunk driver. It was the only time in my, I was a trial judge before I was a Supreme Court justice, the only time in my in the, in the 35,000 cases I handled as a trial judge when I looked at the defendant and said, you are a danger to your fellow citizens and the only thing we can do is to lock you up. But there are people who come in for drunk driving with a .06 with a clean record and a job and a family that relies on it. Well, there's no point in sending that person to prison. But if you've made a campaign promise, you might bloody well want to do it in the interest of democracy. And, and, and you don't have to think very long about other hypotheticals that affect the business community or other elements of society. So, so it's, and, and the decision in the williams U. Lee case is can a judge send you a request signed by her or candidate in this case, will you give to my campaign or is that a violation of the First Amendment? And that will be a 5-4 decision. And um, not clear to me how it's going to turn out. Um, I'd like to think that what Justice Kennedy had to say that morning was favorable, but I have a friend who's on the other side of this issue, and he thought it was favorable to him. So we'll wait and see. Well, I think yeah, I, we don't want to leave you all depressed um, um, after this <laughs> recitation of what seems to be a troubling pattern in our, in our state. Uh, judiciary. So I, I think it would be important for us to talk a little bit about um, what do we do about this? Um, CED's report, again, has uh, a number of, of recommendations, um, uh, but I, let's, let's unpack it a little bit, uh, talk about what are the different uh, op options, what do some states do that you think works um, 
the, the mix of, of, of merit selection and retention election, is that a good way? Should we have only have it be like more like the federal system where you, it's all, you get put on and then it's a lifetime or at least some term? Um, because I think, you know, we want to leave people, I think with, um, first, this is obviously an incredibly important issue. It's affecting your businesses. It's affecting people's lives. It's not doing justice, that's for sure. But we all want to take home something um, that's actionable. So what should we be working on? Well, in terms of what the CED trustees have concluded, there's more or less uh, three basic pillars you might think about it in terms of uh, reform. Uh, we have concluded that given the inherent problems in elections, uh, the best approach is a, an appointment-based approach. Uh, we favor a commission-based approach uh, similar to that used in Arizona, uh, where they have a judicial nominating com commission uh, that's formed of a group of 16 citizens, uh, the majority of whom, 10, are not lawyers. Uh, that group is responsible for reviewing uh, the credentials and qualifications of potential nominees and soliciting nominees. Uh, they then make a list of recommended uh, appointees to the governor so that the governor can choose from that list that has been vetted and viewed by the commission. Uh, and we believe that this type of approach really uh, ensures that you get a review of the qualifications of the potential nominees and gives you the broadest possible pool to choose from so that you're not stuck with just those candidates who are willing to endure the rigors of a political campaign in order to seek the office. Uh, second, uh, we support stricter recusal standards. Uh, one of the ways to ensure against the conflict of interest and the, and the types of issues that Hugh had to deal with was that there is a real need to improve the recusal standards uh, to ensure that they uh, help to avoid the most egregious problems of conflict of interest. And in that regard, particularly uh, standards that have a second review if a judge chooses uh, not to recuse uh, him or herself. And recusal standards that also consider not just things like campaign contributions, but also other aspects of campaigning, uh, particularly large amounts spent by an outside group in relationship to a particular judge along the lines of what the Supreme Court suggested in the Caperton case. And then third, we support judicial performance evaluation commissions as a way of holding judges accountable. A number of states now use such commissions uh, where they review not just the judge's uh, performance on the bench uh, in terms of set criteria, uh, but in some states, such as Arizona, they even solicit the opinions and surveys from witnesses, jurors, court officers, others who come into contact with judges, uh, to rate the performance of the judge so that you can have an objective criteria that assesses a judge's performance on the bench and then makes a recommendation for reappointment or not reappointment uh, to the governor. Uh, as a way to take out a lot of the political pressures that you now see in the current election system and avoid some of the problems that we're now seeing emerge in the retention process. One of the reasons that um, many states moved to uh, popular election of judges, uh, this was after Andrew Jackson's you know, push for popularity, was really to make the courts more fair and more independent. Uh, because a lot of these judges were being appointed through secret deals. You know, they're in uh, behind closed doors and, and the governor's lobbyists would uh, have a lot to say about who was uh, on the bench. Um, the, the great thing about the Arizona model is that the commission meets in public over the internet. All their deliberations are public. The public can comment on, on who they think is a good or a bad judge. It's, in, it's out in the, in the open. Um, I, in, in Texas, when there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court, the, the governor can make an appointment. And I have seen over the 13, almost 13 years I was on the bench, uh, in those instances, uh, behind closed doors, the lobbyists for industry groups or trial lawyers or the medical organization or, uh, you know, automobile dealers or whatever, they're trying to get their people on and the public has no clue that any of this is going on. So I support uh, the Arizona model, and Sandra Day O'Connor was instrumental in putting that in place. She is a hero in terms of, uh, you know, trying to get fair and impartial judges on our state courts, and it's a wonderful thing that she is still aggressively pursuing this. So uh, if you have any contact in your states uh, with 
the leaders and the executive and legislative branches on this issue and talk to your chief justice about it, uh, that would be, uh, that would be a, a wonderful area of reform. It's, it's a challenge to get it done, but it's, um, I think, the best possible system. And I, I just want to add something, too. The, the, um, in West Virginia, which literally the Supreme Court became kind of the laughing stock of Supreme Courts in, in the United States after my case, um, they basically rejected all, all, all of these reforms. They, they rejected uh, recusal reform and whatever else. I think they put in a little business court or something maybe, but that's about it. And, um, and, and, and in West Virginia, like a lot of states, which I, I really disagree with, is the state Supreme Court controls the entire judicial system in West Virginia. So they, they, are, they are in charge of all the judges and all the magistrates and everybody right up to them, but they're also in charge of the uh, Judicial Review Board. And they appoint the members of the Judicial Review Board. And surprisingly, in my case, and particular, particularly with uh, Spike Maynard, who went off vacationing, there was never any there were never there was never any review or was he ever brought in in front of the Judicial Review Board to uh, um, See if he should remain on the on the uh, on the Supreme Court. So, um, I, I totally agree with what they're saying about the Arizona model. I think that's that's certainly the way to go. But in in states where we do have partisan elections, and um, you have to have recusal reform. You just have to do it. Uh, that's the only way we're going to ever be able to uh, ensure. And, and, and everything is on a a reasonable person standard. It's not, it's not whether the judge or the justice thinks he should recuse himself. It's what a reasonable person uh, would, would think. And you couldn't be a reasonable person and look at my case and say, well, Justice Benjamin could be fair. He just got $3.5 million from Don Blankenship, and he'll, he'll be fair. So, you know, those, those, these are the things that have to be reformed. And it's pretty difficult to do when you have a Supreme Court that controls the entire court. Wallace Jefferson speaks my heart on this. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I, I'm conscious that I think we have only a few minutes left. Um, so if, if, uh, if I would love to entertain some questions, um, I would just say, you know, I'd, I'd sort of, I work on these issues and have worked on them for many years. Um, so I was sort of uh, disappointed with myself in the last election in Maryland where I live. Um, where we do elect judges um, to find out that there was actually an additional judge uh, nominee on the slot for three slots. There was all of a sudden there were four candidates and I realized I had never really paid attention even myself to uh, who was on the ballot uh, because none of these elections had ever been contested and all of a sudden we had a note of, uh, I, I don't know if it was exactly partisanship but there was a contest um, and you know I, I didn't know exactly what to do about that. I tried to research um, I wanted to vote as an educated person. Most of the people I know said they just decided not to vote for any of the judges, and they never do, and um, that's one way of, of dealing with it, except that, that, that when I did research, I found out that there were very few groups, um, and they were you know, independent interest groups that, that were writing um, you know, who we should vote for, and, and that's a really troubling situation. I think that's just a, on the small scale, but you see it when you start paying attention to your own ballots and you start um, thinking about you know, whether do any of you, you know, know I mean, you mostly are living in, in places where you probably vote for your judges, um, you know, are we paying attention to who they are and the fact that we're actually voting for them? You know, it's, it's kind of disturbing, I think, for, for me, certainly, to think of somebody who's so deeply immersed in this um, that hadn't really paid the, that, that much attention to it. So <laughs> uh, we'd like to think of blind justice, but um, it's unfortunate. I think the Williams U. Lee case really makes you wonder how can, how can justice be blind when, um, he or she is looking in the eye of a contributor and asking for money. Um, so, uh, Bert. Uh, thank you, my name is Bert Brennenberg. I'm executive director of a group called Justice at Stake, and I have a question for the two justices, but since this is Washington, D.C., I'm legally required to preface any question with a comment of my own. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's largely a thank you to, to CED for doing this um, because um, Justice at Stake, which actually we're, we're honored to be, have as our honorary chair, Justice O'Connor, and Justice Shepard is on our board, and Mike Petro was on our board for a while, has really carried the flag on this issue um, for, for a while now. We were pleased to work with Tony early on and have been providing a lot of the data over the years about what you've been hearing about. And I wanted to put a plug in for some of what was described here that you know, we found in polling, we did along with CED, focus groups with business executives, 
that they're very concerned about what's going on, that there's a high preference for stability and quality in legal systems, and an increasing fear that competitive elections are no longer providing that, the merit selection system really seems to offer a lot more promise um, in, in, in to, to, to offer that. My question for the two justices would be, given what you've seen and the changes you've seen in the systems, what do you think all of this is doing to who wants to become a judge in the first place, and who self-selects them out themselves out of even trying to become a judge? Well, in, in our state, we, we have the chance to see um, uh, the difference because it's uh, mostly the, the, it's the appellate judges in some of the large urban areas that have merit selection, and, and the rest of the state all has, um, all has a part of, partisan election. Um, one of the characteristics of small voting units like individual counties is that they tend to lean one way or the other. There'll be a Democratic county or a Republican county. And what that means is that unless you're ready to knock on every door, um, uh, only the Democrat, Democratic lawyers can be candidates and the Republican lawyers just stay home or vice versa. So, so that arrangement sort of would, I would expect, blows up uh, uh, when you get to a state the size of Oregon, or to, just to use one example. So the, and I have had candidates, uh, because I chaired the Judicial Nominating Commission under our system, um, uh, that sent to the governor the names of uh, three people uh, whom the governor should consider for appointment. And I've had people say to me, literally, I, I would have never offered myself uh, but for this opportunity, if I had to go out and r raise a million dollars in order to be a legitimate contender in, a, yeah. in an election, I simply wouldn't have done it. So uh, we, we did have candidates who could have done that, and they came too. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, 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 and actually got chosen uh, occasionally. So it, 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 uh, makes, it does make a big difference in who offers uh, himself or herself. I would say real briefly that the kind of judge that you want on the Supreme Court of Texas is a judge who's at the top of her game. You know, the, the head of the law firm, the general counsel for a major corporation, academic uh, superiority you know, throughout their career, work ethic and all of that. And that lawyer who you want on the, on the Supreme Court is going to be thinking, okay, number one, uh, I, may, I may be on the Supreme Court, but I could lose through no fault of my own just because there is a partisan sweep in my state. And do I want to give up all my clients and my career or my academic um, you know, uh, uh, security uh, for that? The, the, the second thing that they think about is do I really want to open myself up to the politics of the day, the Tea Party and the liberals or the what, you know, all the, am I being drawn into abortion debates when that's really not my role or, or Obamacare and all that and be in the headlines? Do I really want to do that? And most, uh, most lawyers in these, uh, at, the, at the firms or, or in the academia uh, don't really want to do that. And the third thing they think about is um, how long can I uh, financially manage if I were on the court? I've got kids who are on the way to college and I can't afford on this salary to, to pay for them. And so the, the, the truth is this sort of system uh, uh, makes it more difficult for people to choose the, uh, that route. Um, and some of that is true in the merit selection states as well, is the financial aspects of it. Um, but you don't necessarily get the most qualified. We're lucky when we do, and we have some brilliant and great uh, judges in all, in the states where, where uh, there, there are partisan elections. But I think I think it is um, a matter of luck and and some commitment to public service and sacrifice for those who who engage in that. Are there any other questions? Um, you know, it's hard to see. Um, people, so uh, these lights are bright. I was thinking it's sort of like enhanced interrogation yes. technique, you know. Can you hear me? I, Good. I could Thanks. vaguely see a, a okay. gentleman over there. Um, my name is David Young. I'm chairman of Oxford Analytica. I happened to be in Singapore two weeks ago during the funeral of Lee Kuan Yew, and I met a good friend who's in the civil service there, and I said, what was the secret of your success over the since 65 when Lee Kuan Yew came to power. And he said, the third world has a big problem in corruption. And Lee Kuan Yew took it from the top and he made the civil servants the highest paid people in the society. And that's how he really uh, undertook and, and made Singapore, I would say, at least the least corrupt of the third world countries. And in a lot of ways, it's a great model. And to this day, that has continued. 
And when I think about this and hear these stories, I'm just almost ashamed as an American living in Europe now for 40 years to see where we've come in this. So we have something to learn from that very simple lesson from Lee Kuan Yew. And I just wonder how hopeful, my question would be, how optimistic, how hopeful are you that you can get the public behind you in this? Because it seems as money's become more and more important in the American election system, is that going to dominate the judiciary and the law as well? Thank you. Well, in the path that we are on now, uh, it is certainly the case that the uh, money and the electioneering is going to become more and more important. Uh, the hopeful aspect is that you see pockets now uh, throughout the country where uh, states or localities are starting to recognize the problem and trying to work for change. And the difficulty is that uh, that change is right now taking two directions. And, and I think this is why CED's effort is so important in the work of the American Constitutional Society and Justice O'Connor and others. Because on the one side, you have some states who are now starting to uh, move away uh, from the partisan model or some states where they have adopted stricter recusal laws, some states where they are trying to start to use things like judicial performance evaluation, but it's very difficult. The voters are very resistant to giving up their role in this process. And what's happening, therefore, is another direction of reform we're starting to see is the use of ballot initiatives or bills in state legislatures that would be designed to further politicize the process uh, where they use merit-based selection. Uh, for example, bills that are trying to change the composition of some of the nominating commissions so that the governor, for example, would be able to determine all the appointees or have the majority of the appointees be of his political party. So that on the one side, uh, you're getting lots of response to the types of activity we're seeing going on. Uh, some of that I would view as favorable responses that are moving in the right direction. The other is uh, an unfavorable response that is moving towards further politicalization of the courts. Uh, so it's going to be a task in terms of public education. And I think that, you know, that is one of the real challenges we face. However, when you do present these issues, especially to the business community, the thing that has struck me is how little debate there is about these issues. I mean, they, they understand the issue and they are willing to take action to try to bring about change so that you can get uh, coalitions built that cross different politics, that cross different uh, sectors uh, of the economy because they all have the same interest in impartial rule of law. So that for the most part, the business community in some states, for example, Pennsylvania, uh, New Mexico, uh, and I think in Minnesota they're currently doing work uh, with CED, where the business community is really willing to take a leadership role on this because they understand how important this is. Uh, you know, just to give you an idea, as we started talking about the role of these state courts, if you view it just from a business perspective, a third of the litigants in, in state appellate courts are business litigants. And one study that was just done showed just between 2010 and 2012, there were more than 2,300 business-related cases in state high courts that were decided by state high courts. So they play an enormously important role in terms of uh, the rule of law with respect to the business community. And therefore, you can uh, uh, really see the potential with greater education of starting to build up a, a coalition to bring out some of these reforms that are needed, particularly with respect, as Hugh notes, uh, in terms of recusal and this sort of thing. I'm a little optimistic, actually. Um, uh, three days ago, there was a vote in North Carolina in the General Assembly to uh, put in uh, retention votes after the first term of justices in, uh, in North Carolina. They'd had a dalliance with public funding that collapsed and some very ugly recent uh, big dollar elections and the interest groups didn't like the way it turned out and so even if you can't even if you can't get the general public to focus on this if you can if you can line up a sufficient uh, number of the of the 
cognoscenti, so to speak. I, there was time in our state when it looked like there was a lot of talk about going back to the good old days of partisan election. I ran into the state chairman for one of the political parties, a, an old friend, and I, I said, are you, are you taking a role in this? And he said, well, my guys are sort of interested in this. I haven't said anything to them yet. And I said, I said if I had to run on a statewide ballot for re-election, do you think I could raise a million dollars? He thought about it for me. He said, oh yeah, I think you could raise at least a million dollars. Whose pocket do you think the million would have gone into if it didn't go into mine? And he said, yeah, I guess I better talk to my guys. <laughs> and uh, that didn't happen. Well, on that note, um, I, we are unfortunately out of time, um, as much as I know we'd all like to continue. Um, so can we give a round of applause for this wonderful panel?